What's going on, everyone? Taylor Kyle's here for CLNS Media, coming at you with another episode of Pats Daily, brought to you by our good friends at Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of CLNS Media. But more from them later. For now, we have a lot of stuff that we learned at the NFL's annual league meetings. Gerard Mayo spoke, Robert Kraft spoke. We got a better idea of what they're thinking in terms of the third overall pick. We found out that Gerard Mayo is very opening to trade it, although we also know that Kraft would probably like a quarterback, as would most of Pat's nation. But we are going to go through some potential trade scenarios. The Patriots are open to listen to offers. Obviously, we got the Vikings, but we're also going to talk about some other ways the Patriots can maybe stay in quarterback range and trade back in the first round, some ways that they can accumulate more picks in the first couple rounds. We're going to go over all of those. But first, before we get into all that fun stuff and talk about some rule changes, everyone's favorite, Alex, how you doing, buddy? Good morning. Good. Good morning, Taylor. How's it going? It's going well, man. I think this is the earliest I've ever done a show before. So uh, you are my <laughs> cup of coffee in the morning. I'm very excited for this. Same to you. <laughs> all right. Now, let's start with, again, everyone's favorite rule changes. So the NFL passed a few. Honestly, I think relative to what we usually get, there were some pretty good rules for the most part. Although, obviously, when these things happen, they tend to be pretty polarizing, especially the first one I want to talk about. Now, the hip drop tackle ban. It's not just the actual tackle. It's specifically the swivel technique where players would sometimes fling their lower bodies underneath bigger uh, offensive players, try to stop for momentum and bring them down, but obviously led to multiple lower body injuries, as Patriots fans know. Ramondre Stevenson suffered one late in the season, and it took him out with a high ankle sprain. What did you think about that rule? Because I felt like it was one that needed to be addressed in some capacity uh, because it feels like a very specific style of tackle that just is not worth uh, the effects that it actually had. But I also understand defenders being kind of annoyed uh, that this is just another obstacle in the way of them doing their jobs. And something like this, I default to the players. None of the players, including offensive players, wanted to see it overruled. And a big problem is when you make that kind of tackle, a uh, guy's feet, ankles, knees get stuck, play on grass. And that that wouldn't completely get rid of all the injuries. But if the whole idea is we're doing this to cut down on injuries, there's a very real tangible way to do that, that the players are all for, that the owners won't do because it'll cost them a little bit more money. I yeah. uh, is injury rates, especially ACLs, are significantly higher on turf than grass. That doesn't mean ACLs don't happen on grass. Mm. But if, you know, it happens on four out of every hundred plays on turf and two out of every hundred plays on grass, and you think about how many plays, and those are arbitrary, I don't know the actual number. Those are arbitrary numbers off the top of my head. But the idea is multiply that over the thousands and thousands of plays we have over the course of a season. How many injuries do you save? if you go to all grass and they have the technology now to put grass in indoor buildings. So that's not no longer an obstacle. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yes, it's a little more expensive, but if the whole idea is the owners want to protect their investments in the players, obviously we know the players don't want to get hurt. This seems like a win-win, but instead let's, and let's call it hip tack, uh, hip drop tackles. There are other tackles. You can't go high. And I understand why you can't go high. I, that's a good rule. You shouldn't be able to torpedo yourself into another player. So I have no problem with that, but you can't go high. Players don't want tacklers going too low because then there's a whole host of injuries that come from that. Yeah. So now your options are either you got a shoulder tackle, which doesn't work. It just, I hate shoulder tackling. It It's guys trying to look flashy. It doesn't work. Or you have to truly be like the most technique form fitted tackler, especially in a league where over the last 10 years, defensive players have gotten smaller. You now have 210, 220 pound linebackers. You have 180 pound corners. And if I'm an NFL team and I see this rule change, I'm going out. I'm not drafting any players to carry the ball under 210 pounds. I'm going out and get me a bunch of high motor, leg churning, physical, mean mother efforts that are not going to go down because you go and, and look, Ramondre Stevenson, right? Yeah. How is a 180 pound corner? If you can get Ramondre Stevenson to the edge, how is a 180 pound corner supposed to tackle him without using his own body weight? Well, honestly, it's honestly, not happen. the only thing you really can do is rally to the football. Like Jabril Peppers kind of mentioned it. And you look at guys like him where Jabril did miss a few right. tackles last year, but the defense was so good at swarming. You really didn't notice because there was always well, somebody bring those guys down. And but, that's the, the emphasis is more, but I understand also. That so, but here's the thing. How many yards is Ramondre Stevenson going to drag the guy before everybody else gets there? 
enough to help the NFL with its scoring problem. You just turn what AJ did is turn any ball carrier over 215 pounds into Rob Gronkowski, assuming this rule is called. I mean, we'll see. Remember a couple of years ago they put in that stupid rule about ball carriers couldn't lower their heads and everybody we can't play football with this. And then they just I don't think that's ever been called. So maybe mm. this is one of those where they put it in and say they put it in and they'll find players after the fact. But if it's never going to get called, then obviously it doesn't change anything. If this is something they're actually going to enforce, and I don't really know how they enforce it, but if yeah. this is something they're actually going to enforce, I have no again, just go get me a bunch of leg churners. Go get me a bunch of go get me a bunch of AJ Dillons. Go get me, you know, Quadzilla, guys like that. They go get me a bunch of LeGarrette Blunt type players or I don't want to say like Rob Gronkowski's, but those big physical tight ends and just let them run through the secondary all day because that's what they're going to do. Tip Raymond, baby. No, but I mean, I I understand. It's the biggest thing with me is how this is actually going to be enforced. Like the rule, right. again, I don't have a huge problem with the rule itself as long as it's just like, no, this is a blatant, you know, form of tackling that could potentially injure somebody. And again, that's it's easier said than done because even on Twitter, people aren't really sure what a hip drop tackle is or the swivel specifically. So, right. you know, it's it, it's just going to come down to how it's legislated and how whether this is going to be something that really impacts the game in a negative way, like we've seen with a ton of rule changes, or if it's something where they really are just trying to get a specific style out of the way. We'll see what happens. Now, the kickoff rule, this is one that I feel like was generally well-received. We have some people who are obviously, you know, you're never going to please everyone, but it seems like the vast majority of fans do actually like the rule. I can go into detail about it. I'll pull up the tweet because I definitely am not smart enough to break it down on my own specifically. All right. So actually, I'll put this over and share the screen so everybody can get an idea of what it actually looks like. All right. So let me zoom in on this too. Let's see. There we go. All right. So. For the kicking team, the 10 players cannot move until the ball hits the ground or a player in the landing zone or the end zone. So first, just to get an idea of what this actually looks like, it's going to be different because the idea here is to eliminate the violent collisions that were leading to just an unsustainable number of concussions. So actually, Alex, how well versed are you? Can you break it down just by looking at this or should I pull up the rules? No, yeah, I, I, I can explain that. So it's the kicker's back where he was. Uh, and and I would encourage people to go watch the XF, go watch actual XFL kickoffs because it's mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But basically, so the rest of the kicking team is in that blue area. Nine or ten members of the return team are in that yellow area. So there's, and I think the kickoff everybody has to be on the line. So it's not really the forty to the forty five. It's everybody has to have a foot on the forty. The return team, I it's it's and this is where it's a little different from the XFL. In the XFL everybody was, there was a 10 yard buffer and everybody was foot on the line. The way the NFL is doing it, if I read it correctly, is they just all have to be in that five yard window. They could be anywhere in that five yard window. So you get a five to 10 yard buffer, depending on where guys are standing. I would think, and, and this is going to be the fun part of this. Teams are going to experiment with this. We're going to see all these different things throughout camp, throughout the preseason, into the regular season. And We'll see what works, but I would assume at least some teams are going to stagger it. I think there's value in staggering it between being at the 35 and being all the way back at the 30. You then have one or two returners back in what's that landing zone. Now, note the landing zone does not include the end zone. That is an important distinction here that I think some people have missed. Once the ball is kicked off, nobody but the kicker and the returners can move. Mm -hmm. And once the returners touch the ball or it hits the ground, then everybody can move and it just becomes a scrimmage play. But here's the thing. People are saying that this encourages more touchbacks. It actually doesn't. Unless you really, really, really know what you're doing. Yeah. If you kick the ball into the landing zone, it hits, it rolls into the end zone. That's a 20-yard touchback. So no more 20 foot. The 25-yard touchback is gone, mm -hmm. as I understand it. If it hits the ground and it rolls into the end zone, that's a 20-yard touchback. If you kick it directly into the end zone, and the returner doesn't run it out, which I can't imagine they would in this situation, it's a 35-yard touchback. So kicking the ball through the back of the end zone, the offense starts at the 35. Some people think teams will give that up. I don't know. I don't know. I, maybe if you have Devin Hester back there, but I don't <laughs> think everybody's going to give up. Think about it. That's a, that's a, that's a, compared to the old kickoff, that's, that's an extra 10 yards. You're essentially giving them an extra first down. Yeah. Uh, if you kick the ball out of bounds or short of the landing zone, it goes to the 40. So, and that's just like the old out of bounds rule. It would go to the 40 yard line. It's just, if you come up short of the 20, no more surprise onside kicks. That's the one casualty here. I don't mind that. There were only two in the last year. 
Uh, if you want to make an onside kick now, you have to declare that. It's only allowed in the fourth quarter in overtime. One thing I thought I saw, like I saw it scrolling and I meant to bookmark it and I didn't, and I'm trying to find it. The one thing I, I, if anybody can find it and send it to me. So don't, I don't know this for sure, but I feel like I saw it. The concession is they're going back to the unbalanced kickoff. So in the past, you had to have hmm. five on one side, five on the other. Now when it's an onside kick, you can do the overload. So you can yep. put, I think it's, I think you have to have at least three guys on each side. So that, that gives you seven. And so onside kicks now, even though there's no more surprise ones, I think become, if that's a thing, assuming I didn't imagine that, onside kicks actually become, there's going to be a higher success rate on onside kicks. So yeah. I think that's a fair trade-off because look, the kickoff was going to go away. The play was dangerous. There was no incentive to do it. I really thought the league was going to eliminate it and just say, we're starting with the ball 25 and this is what it is now. Mm -hmm. This gives us a kickoff. And I, I would encourage people, Ian, I think people are going to hate this right away. Because it looks gimmicky. It looks super gimmicky when you watch it. I will fully admit that. And I hated it at first when I was watching the XFL last year. When you actually kind of get past that, once you've seen enough of them that you're used to seeing that setup, it's super fun. Because it sort of mirrors the scrimmage play. You right. can do stuff, especially if you have two returners back there. There are teams that did end arounds. There was a team that did kind of a version of a read option. Where the, the guys in the setup zone essentially let one guy through and the two returners read it. Um, there's a ton of goofy things you can do with this. And I think that as it goes on, teams are going to get more creative. They're going to find out more ways to kind of game the system with this. And the kickoff's exciting again. At one point, it was billed as the most exciting play in football. That was years ago. It was a lifetime ago. But the kickoff's exciting again. So I'm all for this. It definitely changes the way you build your special teams units a bit. I'll tell you this, getting Jalen Rager back at the price the Patriots did, outstanding. Marcus yep. Jones, I'd put the two of them back there and run some stuff with them. Um, in terms of kickoff coverage, guys, I think what you're going to see more now is there's going to be more of a, you know, on the kickoff, there'd be offensive and defensive players. On kickoff return, there'd be offensive and defensive players because kickoff is all about speed and kickoff return is all about brute force. Now you need guys on your return team that can tackle in space. So you're going to see it be more linebackers and safeties. Between I think points, there, yeah. right. There's going to be more for return outside of the returners, guys that are used to handling blocking assignments and not just see a body hit a body and guys that can block on the run. So you're going to see tight ends. You're going to see bigger receivers. You're going to see maybe some of the more athletic tackles mm -hmm. out there in that setup zone. Does that mean the end of specialists like Matthew Slater? No, because I think there will be guys that come from college that, you know, were linebackers or safeties. And well, so one, you still need them on the punt team. You still need gunners on the punt team. Right. Two, there will be guys that come from college who are linebackers or safeties or whatever in college that maybe can't play linebacker or safety at the NFL level, but they're just really sure tacklers. And that's what they are. Those are the guys you're going to look for here. So I think there still will be Define specialists. There'll just be less of them, and the makeup of that player will change. You, you, Matthew Slater would still have a role in something like this. He's a really good tackler. Speed mm -hmm. doesn't matter as much, and obviously he was fast, but it's tackling. Um, a guy like a Nate Ebner may not have as much of a role because he was more just go down, hit a body, right. and take somebody out. Where you're lined up 10 yards apart, 5 yards apart, that whole mm -hmm. massive collision isn't a part of it anymore. Well, with the tight ends probably having a bigger role in this, I know that Alex Anfeld can be very happy about that. Uh, but also, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Like, there's also – you can have more, like, man zone blocking assignments and, like, it's going to kind of be a run play in some aspects where just the way you kind of draw it up. Obviously, the most creative and innovative special teams coaches are going to benefit from this a lot more quickly. It's going to be really frustrating for the people who don't kind of really embrace this because – you're going to have to deal with people who are kind of already ahead of the curve and trying new things. So can't be stuck in your ways, but I mean, it's going to be fun whenever we get to talk to Jeremy Springer and see how coaches actually feel about these rules. Cause right now, I mean, we're kind of just talking amongst ourselves. We haven't got so, how coaches feel about it. Mm. My understanding is the heavy majority of special teams coaches like this mm -hmm. be one, sense. because it allows them to be creative, but mainly because if it's this or taking the kickoff out of the game altogether, it's a no brainer. Right. What I would do if I'm the Patriots or any NFL team, I would go, even as a consultant, maybe you don't put them on staff full time, but I'd throw a guy a couple thousand bucks, 
who was coaching in the XFL last year, special teams and say, can you come in and talk to us and let us pick your brain? Yeah, that's, that's absolute. And I, their season starting this week. I don't know how many of those guys are, are back on their staff or, or whatever, but, or maybe you do it, you know, down the road, closer to camp. That's the one other impact you're going to see from this. And people are going to hate this, but I don't really care. You're going to see more time spent on kickoff and kickoff return at spring practices and training camp this year than you have ever because this is new and teams are going to need to drill it and they're going to need to get it right. So we are going to see a lot of special teams, a lot of kickoff practice at, uh, at, at, at training camp. I want to bring this up. Uh, one good block and it's a touchdown. Yeah. That's what kickoffs were for a long yeah. time. <laughs> that's what it, the play is supposed to be. That's the thing. People complain about that. It's supposed to be an exciting play. It's supposed to be a potentially game changing play. And that reminds me of one more thing in terms of personnel. Fast kickers, fast yes. kickers that can tackle. Now mm -hmm. thing, because that guy still gets a running start. That guy's coming in with a full head of steam. Now I watched a little bit of XFL teams doing it. Some teams would use the kicker as the security blanket. Some teams mm -hmm. would just have the kicker essentially run up to like the 50 and kind of hang out there in case the guy breaks through it. You still need a sure tackling kicker. The other thing some teams would do again, because that guy has a head of speed. They would send the kicker down and one guy from the initial coverage unit would go back and essentially mm -hmm. be replaced by the kicker. So you already get into the strategy of it, but fast kick or punters, I guess, whoever's handling your kickoffs, fast kickers or punters who, you know, you're not going to get Luke Keekly out there as your kicker tackling, but who are capable tacklers can at least get their body in the way. There's more value in that. Now it's not the be all end all, but your kicker being able to make plays and coverage is now a factor. It wasn't yeah. a factor. It really wasn't a factor before we was, if, if you let it get to the kicker, you already blew it. You shouldn't be expecting to have the kicker make a play. And that's still true to an extent, but also there, that guy now has a slightly different role where you can maybe take advantage of it. If your kicker does have some of those abilities. And the kicker, it's not really going to be about just like booming it out of the back of the end zone. Now it's going to be about hang time. It's going to be about accuracy and where you can actually place it. So that's going to be another thing. A lot of the time we just see like punters, like Bryce Berenger is the kickoff guy for the Patriots because he's got a big leg. But now it's going to be interesting. Do you have to get guys who more specialized, who, again, are more accurate kickers rather than guys who are just have strong legs? So it's going to be a lot of pretty significant differences. But again, it's saving a play from the game that we were almost going to get legislated out. So I think overall it's got to be seen as a win-win, a rare win-win when we talk about some of these moves. Two other ones I want to go over really quickly that, again, I think are actually positive uh, changes that the Patriots uh, – positive changes the league is making. Now, before roster cut-down days, usually if you were placed on injured reserve before final cuts, you're done for the season. Now – teams can actually designate two players to return from injured reserve. So think of an Isaiah Bolden who had to miss the entire season because he was probably going to miss the beginning of the season. They didn't want to spend an entire roster spot on him. Now he and one other player in this situation would actually be able to come back at some point during the season. And also emergency third quarterbacks can now come from the practice squad and have unlimited elevations. What did you think about those two as we tie a bow on the rule changes? It's, it's just more players being involved, which is always good for everybody. So yep. I, I'm glad they capped it at two guys returning from IR. Like you can't, you would have teams just placing everybody on IR, right. And keeping That's everybody in. And, and that would be overkill. But I, I think, and, and I'm sure this will grow at some point because the union sees it as more players getting contracts, but I, I think that's a fair. I also think it's good that it's on players place on IR on cut down day, not before. Right. Because that you still like, you still have that spot on your 90. Like he's still taking mm -hmm. up a spot on the 90. It's not essentially a free roster spot. So I like that. And the quarterback thing, you know, it's a shame for Malik Cunningham. It wasn't a year earlier. Cause that's, I think what, exactly what we all wanted to see from him. But again, it's, it's just more players getting involved, which is never a bad thing. Always a good thing. All right. We are going to dive into those trade scenarios. We talked about earlier, but first quick word from our friends at prize picks. Be right back. Football season may be over, but the action on the floor is heating up. Whether it's tournament season or the fight for playoff home court, there's no shortage of high stakes basketball moments this time of year. Get in on the excitement with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app, where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. Want to play alongside some of Prize Picks' favorite players like Meek Mill and Sugar Sean O'Malley? You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app 
to view entries from some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Prize picks even offers injury insurance so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and doesn't return in the second, that player projection won't count against you and the rest of your entry stays live. With Jason Tatum going for the MVP, I'm taking more on his points and rebounds. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. That's code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right, let's get to some mock drafts. So we're going to go over a few different permutations of this. Like I said, we want to see what can happen. Uh, different ranges where the Patriots basically are just trying to stockpile on early round picks. The first one we're going to look at is the Godfather offer. All right, so this would be a trade with the Vikings where the Patriots acquire 11 and 23, but also get a first round pick next season and a first round pick in 2026, as well as a future day two pick. Alex, give us the context on this type of trade and why this is even on the table. Because this seems like an obviously a dream scenario, but that's why they call it the grandfather offer. Yeah, this is if the Vikings want to move up. I, you know, if Patriots look at what the Niners gave up to move up to third a couple of years ago. I think you're sitting there and saying, why should we take any less than that? Mm -hmm. And I know the pick didn't work out. And people would say, well, you know, the Vikings don't want to be like the Niners because that pick was a bust. Fine. If they don't want to be like the Niners and they don't have to make the trade. It's that simple. That's so that's that to me is anything less than this would be a disappointment. If they're moving at 12 or 11, if they're moving at six, right with the giants, you're not going to get three first round picks, but you're also still, you have a top six pick uh, yeah. anything outside of the top 10 to me. This is the, the baseline offer baseline yeah. as in, yeah. Ooh, sorry. sorry, as in I'm calling other teams and saying this offers on the table. Can you top it until the Vikings give me a reason to get off the phone? I like that. Now, when we did this before, when we first heard about the Vikings getting the pick, most of what we did early on was get Brock Bauer. So we're going to try to do something else different here. Let me throw it up on the screen. All right. How many rounds we think? It's just like five because we got a few of these to go. Yeah. Five, all right. Okay. So get the Vikings up here. All right. So we're going for 11, 23, round one pick. What would you go for third rounder or just hypothetically, we can't go into 2026. So. How would you want this to work out from the um, next Yeah, time? I guess we can't do it. Um, just call it the future third with, yeah, that's three first round picks and a future day two pick. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So that's exactly. And then hypothetically, we'd have also a 2026 first rounder for the trade. No, because we're getting the three. We're uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. You're right. Sorry. Yeah, you're right. Continue. Okay. Force trade. I'm not starting the draft first. I'm doing it in the right order. All right. So we got Brock Bowers last time, but. It's looking like Olufa Shani is probably going to be available at this pick. Now, I think we both like Troy Fautanu, but probably a little too early for him. Are we comfortable taking Olu? Uh, yeah, I, he's he's one of the blue chip. I'm, I'm guessing he's the, I didn't see who else fell there, but it looks like he's the last blue chip. Uh, him and, oh, wait, wait, hang on. Is, Ro hmm. is Roma Tuesday still there? He, I don't, oh, yeah, he's right there. Ooh. Oh, I take Roma Dunze. Look, I, I I know they need a tackle, and the tackle class drops off a little bit. But if you're doing this trade, it means you don't truly believe in any of the quarterbacks in this draft. That's just the reality of it. And if we're working under that assumption, I I just think Roma Dunze is going to be such a good NFL player. I, I've talked about this where he maybe doesn't have the carry the level of the carrying trait that is Marvin Harrison Jr.'s route running or Malik Neighbors' explosiveness, but Tell me what Roma Dunze can't do. Can't. Tell me what his flaw is. Right. He's he's he can make plays at all three levels of the field. He can make plays from the slot. He can make plays from the boundary. He runs, I think, the most complete route tree of any wide receiver in this draft. He's yep. good after the catch. He's good at the catch point. Good hands, strong size, good athleticism. He reminds me personally of a bigger Stefan Dix. That's been my comp form. I know some people have brought up DeAndre Hopkins, Larry Fitzgerald. Mm -hmm. He, I think he's more explosive than those guys. Again, he's not explosive like neighbors, right? But I, I, I just think he's a fantastic player. I'm sprinting the car. I, I know they need a tackle, right? And I know Olu's there, and I, I think Olu Fashan is a really good tackle. But to me, Roma Dunze is like one class higher, and we have another first round pick too. Knowing that, we'll see. There'll be a tackle there at 23 that I think can start. You know, day one. 
Roma Dunze has to me all pro potential. I would take Roma Dunze. And do you, how realistic does this actual draft so far look to you? Because honestly, I can see the top here. I could see Rome flipping because I mean, somebody's going to trade at some point. Let's see. I mean, here, oh, neighbors over Harrison. Um, but either way, you could flip flop that. I, I don't know about the order. I, I don't know about the order okay. here, but so the the reason Roma Dunze is knocked down is because nobody took receivers high, which is possible. This teams could look at it and say this class is so deep at receiver. Well, wait, well, wait. Like you look at a team like, um. Who's a good example here? Well, I don't think the Falcons are taking Joe Alt. They'll take a defensive player. Yeah. Uh, and, and you could, flip, you could flip the Titans, and Titans would take Joe Alt, and then you could say the Falcons right. would well, take Dallas Turner. Right. Or the Falcons could be looking at a receiver. The Bears could be looking mm-hmm. at a receiver, but they might be sitting there and saying, hey, this class drops off hard at tackle. Yeah. You know, after pick 50, whereas we can still get good receivers on day two. Like sometimes a class is so good, it pushes all the players down. Yeah. That's that, true. That it, it, it happens. So it's look, if AD Mitchell had gone up there or Brian Thomas had gone up there, I tell you, this is unrealistic. Do I think this is the most realistic thing? No, I think there's going to be a team that values Roma Dunze. And most likely what would happen is a team trades up in front of the Giants, takes another quarterback where the Cardinals or Chargers are, and the Giants end up taking a Dunze. But if you tell me all these guys went before a Dunze, however it looks, I'd be like, yeah, okay. The Bears, they wanted to make sure they protect Caleb Williams. That makes sense that that's priority. The Falcons, they want to make sure that they protect. I mean, again, I think they'll take a defensive player, but the Titans, they want to get better protection for Will Levis. They need to tackle. Like, that makes sense. So this is probably his floor. Yeah. And I know this is technically the Vikings pick, but somebody will trade up with the Vikings. if, if well, I guess his floor is 12 because the Broncos would definitely take him. But this, this is not the most out of the – park uh permutation no this is not the the when they when jane daniels was falling to 34 in the mocks a month ago a month ago yeah and he's just such a well-rounded player like you already said there's not i mean yes i think that tackle does fall off more significantly but when you talk about those true x receivers and especially one who's got versatility where he doesn't just have to play x rome is one of the few just like perfect fits in this draft so i think yep i think that's fair let's go rome 11 all right, now let's see what we've got left. So Tyler Guyton's really a right tackle, but he's gotten work at left tackle. I believe teams believe he can play there. He was used there um, at times during uh, the Senior Bowl, but also Brian Thomas Jr. and A.D. Mitchell are still there. Now, A.D. has come under, I don't want to say fire, but people have been pointing out recently how his effort comes into question where he doesn't really go 100% when the ball's not coming his way. Obviously, the talent's there. He's an absolute physical freak. And when he's on, he's on and one of the best receivers in this class. So what are you thinking at this pick? Do you want to just get the tackle or do you want to get a pair of weapons? No, you got to take a tackle here. You got because you're not going. How are you going to play Brian Thomas and Roma Dunze? Like that's going to be tough to get them both the snaps they need. I really like Guyton. I think Guyton has left tackle upside in the NFL. Uh, you know, if he's coached right, you're you're working with the Browns coaching staff, former Browns coaching staff that's coached up those big guys. I think he's really impressive. Oklahoma also churns out tackles. I put a little bit of weight on that. I would take Guyton here. All right, just it was, it was tempting. I say it was tempting. But no, it's fair. I don't disagree with the pick. All right, so. I think the Patriots, regardless of what they do, we can pretend that they ignore quarterback, but realistically, I don't think that's going to happen. I think they're going to go, especially if they double dip in the first round, I feel like whoever's the best quarterback on the board goes off in the second. Would you say that's fair? Probably. I would also say this, though. I I think that if you pass on quarterback high, because this is a team that seems to be very conscious of the messaging, I think they understand, you know, why did you half-ass quarterback? I think those are questions they'd wonder about. I think they may want to build that complete roster. What I would do here is I'd look at A.D. Mitchell. Uh, not A.D. Mitchell. Um, Jatavian wow. Sanders. Oh, Jatavian Sanders. We just talked about how, you know, these big physical runners, these elite athletes, are going to be such weapons now that you can't hip drop tackle. Jatavian Sanders is going to run through defense. And now no, you would- really, you, you talk about setting it up for a quarterback. I think you've done that. But I would argue that you could get a tight end with a similar skill set, maybe not as reliable. Because, like, you look at, like, Eric All is one of the most talented guys on this list, but I know he's got an injury history. And a lot of these guys are more projects, whereas Jatavian Sanders could probably contribute right away. But the past the second round, like, 
are Michael Penix Jr. and Spencer Rattler really going to be? I think those are the only two guys who have any shot of starting early on or like being legitimate contributors that are probably going to be left. I'll put them on the board to see who's left. Yeah. But so, here's the thing. If you, if they wanted an early contributor, they wouldn't, they wouldn't make the trade. They, if they want an early contributor, let me say this. They shouldn't make the trade. They shouldn't trade down from three. If they want a quarterback that can start year one, you take the guy. Out. Year one. Do you have any faith in any of these other guys actually being starters at any point? They're like Jordan Travis. Penix, I'm not, Penix, I'm not that's it. If Penix is still here at 34, Rattler, I would take I think Rattler's absolutely got starting upside. Absolutely. He's, I, 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 he's very small. That worries me. The, okay, the I, I agree. The small but... quarterback thing in the NFL has has proven to – those guys can flash. There will be games where they flash. But what has Kyler Murray won? What has Baker Mayfield won when he's not throwing to two all-pro receivers? Look at the issues Bryce Young had last year. And I get the roster wasn't great, but again – it, the, the NFL seems to try because teams are so also, afraid. Kyler, to- Kyler Murray was good when he had like DeAndre Hopkins and AJ Green. Like I don't want to act like Kyler Murray's not done anything. His uh, his teams overall have just. Well, when has he ever had a good offense and defense at the same time? I'm he's not also, like he's also struggled to stay on the field. Fair. I think teams get so worried about missing on the quarterback that they they get they get trait heavy. They look too much at the traits and they lose sight of the big picture. And I think that's why you saw this run. You've seen this run of teams trying to turn five foot eleven, six foot quarterbacks into stars. And look, Drew Brees did it. Drew Brees did it. But for every Drew Brees, how many Chase Daniels are there? Yeah. You know, so it's just the 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 I, it, I, Spencer Rattler is an interesting project. I think if you draft Spencer Rattler, you bring him into camp, you see what he can do, and may, maybe he gets there. But I wouldn't say they came out like you're not going to not draft a quarterback next year because you drafted Spencer Rattler. Yeah, fair. Okay, so right. all right. So without Rattler, is Jatavian Sanders more valuable than a Michael Penix Jr.? I don't think Penix will be here at this point, but uh, no, I would take Penix to me is a, a year one starter and a guy who can make a difference. So Penix over Sanders? Yeah, I didn't think Penix was still here. I would take Penix yeah. here. Yeah. And you got, yeah, like he the Patriots, you got very, very, very lucky. Very lucky that Michael Penix fell at 30. We already got lucky with Rome, so why not just keep right. rolling the dice? Uh, oh, do we want to make it th- uh, three Washington players? Give uh, Tyler Hughes something to get excited about. This is where we've talked about this. They have three big needs in the top 100. They've addressed them all. This is where I go running back or defense. Okay. This is where I double down. And Taylor, we've talked about before, Tavondre Sweat at 68. If they yeah. really knock it out of the park at the top of the draft, I love that pick. I'm I just honestly so curious game. considering they're looking at all these explosive guys. I really do wonder if they would want a Tavondre Sweat. I understand the value. I'm just curious if he fits where they're trending. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So if if we're doing that, I I, I do it's tough taking a running back in the top 100 with the backfield they have. Um especially because Isaac Garendo is probably going to be around in like the fourth or fifth round. Right. So let's so see. Yeah, I was like, there for what about Javon Baker? Corner. How do you feel about Baker? He's I, fine. I, I is he gonna you already drafted Roma Dunze? I think if you're gonna take a receiver, you're gonna take a true slot receiver. I think you got a bunch of slot receivers. I feel like all their guys can play in the slot. Or is is Baker a Z or is he a true X? I think Baker could be I think he's versatile. I think he's like an Xavier Leggett where you can really just put him anywhere. But I Xavier think Leggett's still on the board. Hmm? Xavier Leggett's still on the board. I doubt it. Yeah. No, okay. Sometimes he falls here. Um, now Johnny Wilson's interesting. Again, you're not allowed to use your body weight to tackle. Johnny Wilson, 6'6, 230. That's fair. That is fair. And then well, Malachi Corley, too. He's another guy you could talk about there. They met with they're, they're supposed to be meeting with him or going to his pro day or something yeah. like that. So we know they're interested. Um, okay, so those are the receivers, and then we who's there at corner? There. Corner Max Melton, who I would be interested in. On bigger corner. I I I I Kitchens. Ooh, Cam Kitchens, yep. Jeremiah yeah. Trotter, like Jeremiah Trotter is another one of those players where I don't know that they immediately need a linebacker, but he's just a hell of a player, and there'll yeah, be no. a role for him. He can I be your passing down really linebacker. Sure. Yeah, but I feel like it's Martin Mapu as well. It's tough. Well, they said, uh, was it Mayo said the other day Mapu's going to start working with the safeties? But we know we know how they work. He's a safety, but they use safeties in their dime package of linebackers. So but he's saying, be- can, can Jeremiah Trotter do what Mac Wilson did? Because they had them both on the field at times. 
Can he rush the passer? You've probably seen more Trotter than I have. Trotter? Uh, Trotter? Yeah. Just saying? Yeah. He can rush the passer? Yeah. I mean, I don't think that's the best part of his game, but he's a really instinctive player that I think he can he can get there. You can move him around a lot. Okay. All right. So do we want the versatile linebacker? I like Renato Green as well. He's one of my kind of uh, binkies in the middle rounds if they go defense. So, okay. Green, Trotter, Kitchens, or Max Melton. Who you feeling? Um, I like Trotter because I haven't taken him in a single mock yet. All right, let's do it. This is our fun pick. Yeah. Right, Sione, Sione Vaki, do you think the fourth round's too rich for him? Uh, no, that's actually probably about right. But who's there for a tight end? Because we still didn't take a tight end. Yeah, that's true. Stover. Yeah, I take Kate Stover here. I take Kate. What about Johnson? How do you feel about him? We can probably wait on him. I He's not as, as polished as Stover. But um, him, Sinnott, one of those three guys. If you want, actually, if you want to take Vaki, one of those other tight ends will probably fall to one thirty-seven. Okay. So, we'll and then look, we got our we got our safety and we got our running back. That's true. And all right, so oh, Christian Jones is there too. All right, and we still got Ben Sinnott. Yeah, yeah. I would also right. consider Garendo here, and maybe you just pass tight end off to next year. Yeah, because again, There's Garendo. Pro- Oh, it's so Here's funny. the thing. I, I'm right now in the mindset of draft for hip drop being illegal. Garendo's <laughs> 220 ran a 43. Like that's the exact kind of guy I'm looking at right now. That's fair. Also, you could get a guy like AJ Barner in the sixth. Yeah. Probably. So all right. Yeah, like Garendo here. Yeah. All right. That's gonna wrap up the five round. Let's see how we look. Oh, we actually got May. There we go. There you go. All right, so we got Roma Dunze reuniting with Michael Penix Jr., Tyler Guyton switching over to the blind side in a full-time role, Jeremiah well, Here's the Jr. thing. Wait, here's the thing. I didn't think of this when we were doing it. You can keep mm-hmm. Tyler Guyton on the right side, kick Michael and win to win. You got a whole mass of bodies over there protecting the blind side because we have a lefty quarterback. And G- Gerard Mayo did say that on one who could play left tackle, which was I was pretty surprised. Yeah, by. he I should. I, he, I, I just kind of was – Gerard Mayo said some things that I just think he said to say, because I don't think, I think if you tell, if you tell people everything's a possibility, then nobody knows what's an actual possibility, right? Ah, Saying nothing's an option and saying everything's an option is saying the same thing. But um, Guyton on the right side with Penix would certainly be interesting. I do like that. And then on defense, we got some guys who, I know Sione Vaki, people say he can't really be a playmaker, but I see like a Jabril Peppers, Miles Bryant kind of hybrid defensively. Where he's like, you know, he's got shorter arms, which kind of affects him. You don't really want him in main coverage, but he's really good in zone. He's a good tackler. Uh, I feel like he flies to the ball. I like his play diagnosis and his toughness. Um, and then Isaac Arendo, like you said, we're aiming towards guys that are going to be very difficult to tackle because of the hip drop swivel rules. So I like that draft. I'll All say right. this on Vaki too. He'd be very valuable in the new kickoff rules. I think he would be an incredibly interesting player to use. Yeah, every time I do the mock now, I because this is how I do mocks. It's like what's the news of the day that I'm reacting to. So all the mocks I've been I've been working on the last you know day or two have been in relation to the rule changes. Yeah. Oh, we got a question. All right. First, thank you so much, EJ. After the Sneed trade, what's Hagen's trade value? If AD Kingsley or Leggett aren't there at 34, would you trade down to maximize value, then trade for T? What do you think? I think it's one or the other. I, I think you need 34 to get Higgins. You either trade 34 for Higgins or you trade down. Yeah. And if look, if none of those guys are there and you want to trade 34 for Higgins on draft night, like I'm I've said I'm all for that. I'm on record as saying I would trade 34 pick for T. Higgins. Sneed plays a different position. I don't think it impacts Higgins' value a ton. Maybe the initial report was a late first or early second. Now maybe you're looking more early second than late first. Yeah. Uh, realistically, unless, you know, the Chiefs get desperate or somebody like that, and now they have an extra pick. But uh, I don't, you're not trading down and trading for T. Higgins. I, I don't think that's, I mean, maybe you trade down and, you know, in July, a completely separate trade happens where you trade next year's second for T. Higgins. But I, I don't think the two are related. Agreed. All right. Now, moving on to another permutation of our mock draft. We're going to stay in quarterback range. So we're going to go down to six for 47 and a future first round pick. So we still get that first round, that extra first rounder, but we're not getting a pair of first round picks. So we're going to go with another five round mock. All right. So this is going to be with the giants. So yeah. 47 we've made this trade before. Right. 
oh, well, they're going to act like we can't, but we're going to say that we can. Does this look good to you? Yeah. All right. I like to double check because I'm quite forgetful. All right. So we're at six. Now we're staying in quarterback range. And by the way, if you notice, this time Roma Dunze goes fifth. So there we go. Yeah. Which honestly seems like that's. Ah! Wait a minute. Where the hell is. Marvin Harrison Jr. I mean, yeah, no, there. yeah, yeah, you do that. I, I know you said trade down for a quarterback, but I'll I'll say this again, and I've been very staunch on this. If you truly believe in the quarterback, you do not trade down. You don't. Because what would happen here, and Harrison falling to the six in this scenario is very realistic. Because I'll tell you exactly what happens if the Patriots move from three to six, thinking they're clever enough to get J.J. McCarthy if they like him. The Vikings are going to give up a haul for five, or the Broncos are going to give up a haul for five, or the Raiders or the Saints. All you are doing is helping the Chargers accumulate more picks. All you're doing is helping Jim Harbaugh's stupid agenda. Have you seen the conspiracy theory that's out there that the reason Harbaugh's pumping McCarthy's tires so much is because he knows that if if and when McCarthy goes fourth, it hand delivers him Marvin Harrison Jr.? Oh. And that's why he is telling everybody under the sun that J.J. McCarthy is this quarterback savior, which I kind of believe, not the quarterback savior part, the oh, okay. Robbie and nutshell part. <laughs> but this is essentially what that is. It right. just, it threw Roma Dunze in there. The simulator did. You I mean, take I Marvin like, Harrison here. You and I feel like it is great. We're getting you get an elite receiver regardless. Like those three guys, I think, you know, I think Adunze is probably right outside of their tier. But any of those three, I feel like you'd be pretty happy with because those are day one starters who are going to be playmakers for you. So, yep. All right. Marvin Harrison Jr. And by the way, Harbaugh's not that smart, but he is that crazy. It's a fine line. It's very fine. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, oh, wait. All oh, right. Forgot we didn't get an extra first round pick. All right. So, who are we going with now? Are we going with. Well, Penix I mean, did Penix fall? If, if Penix fell, you take Penix. At, I don't know if you don't want to repeat, but if Penix is there at 34, you take Penix at 34. I don't think it's realistic, but again, if he's there, you take him. Do we want to see what else is out there? Maybe something that we feel better about? I think you've gotten an elite tier receiver and an elite tier quarterback. How do you feel about Jordan Morgan? Guard. I think he's a guard. The arm guard. length worries me. You got to remember, we also have another pick in like 13 picks. Hmm? We have another pick in 13 picks. That's true. All right. Just not waiting until 68. Right. right. So this is where now you go to the tackles and uh, yeah, probably. Yeah. It seems like a good pick. All right. All I right, still think so Patrick Paul should go higher, but I think I'm in the minority on that. So I'll I feel like he's going to be a third rounder just because yeah. he's not ready to, I mean, none of them are really ready to play yet. Right. All right. So we've hit the big three spots. Now, where do we want to go with who's left? I mean, this is the same spot we were in, right? We we just did this. I mean, the, the this is the same draft we just did. The only difference is we have a slightly worse tackle and a different top tier receiver. That's it. How um, do we feel about Gabe Murphy? I don't know much about Gabe Murphy, honestly. He's really talented. I think he's still very raw. Um, he's inconsistent, kind of like his awareness sometimes. Like I was watching him against Oregon State. He flies up field a little too quick, but the tools are definitely there. He's scheme versatile. You can line him up, up and down the formation. I think he's interesting, um, but I think there's probably guys who can contribute maybe earlier on and be more consistent. But then again, I mean, at this range, we're also kind of draft, trying to draft for so, upside. So. I'll say this, and I kind of pitched this before, but I'm a big fan of the idea of diversifying your receivers. And what I mean by that is can you get in base 11 – three guys who are all very different players and mm -hmm. basically force teams to be coverage, um, coverage versatile. So we now have, a, so there, you know, the three main kind of receivers, right? Speed receiver, crafty receiver, big receiver. That's gross yeah. oversimplification, but I'd say 99%. And then the fourth kind would be like the Debo Samuel gadget player. But we have, we now have a route runner in Harrison. We now have our quick guy. We have our jitterbug. In, in Pop Douglas. Yep. So let's go get the biggest receiver on the board in John yeah. Wilson. And because don't just stylistically, it's very difficult. How many teams have the personnel to cover all three of those players? You have to get very creative in how you scheme it up. And this is putting a lot on Alex Van Pelt's plate. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. 
how many teams have the personnel to cover 66230 with basically like a 4340 and a guy who will be a top 10 route runner in the league how many teams have these skills all around to cover that i think that's asking a lot of a defense so and honestly that's kind of what michael Penix had at washington right he had yeah Colt was like the big downfield guy mcmillan mm-hmm. was the burst and Adunze was the size and kind of the rat runner. Um, so <laughs> you're, you're building it up for for a, a guy like Wilson going to do super well with a guy like Penix too. I'm talking myself into this. Yeah, I will say, like, I think Keon Coleman's more that true big. Like, Johnny Wilson is just so big like that. I'm not going to say he's like, you know. I don't think he plays to his size as much as you'd expect of a guy who's that big. But at the same Johnny time. Johnny Wilson. No, sorry. You were about to say what I was going to say. Continue. You, you, you're yeah, no, but I do think that, like, I mean, we talk about, like, route runner. I honestly feel like he's also that kind of guy where he's yeah. smooth. I think he's going to get more separation than maybe, like, a Keon Coleman would. Doesn't have that true, like, just throw like a pulp where you throw it up to him and he's just going to dominate. I don't think he's that guy, but still, that size and catch radius, regardless, is going to be tough to contend with, especially if he's already getting himself open. Johnny Wilson's super weird because everything that – Big receivers are traditionally good at, he's bad at. And everything small receivers are traditionally good at, he's good at. Take Wes Welker, make him 6'6", 230 pounds, and make him afraid of contact. And that's Johnny <laughs> Wilson. He's a really good route runner. Like, he's he's a really good route runner. He's got speed. He can separate. He's got a burst. Uh, the catch radius is good. His hands themselves aren't great, and he doesn't take contact great. So it's this really weird thing where he's not the player you'd expect him to be. But that doesn't necessarily make him a bad player. A six yeah. foot six guy that can cut on a dime still has value, even if he's not going to go up and win above the rim. He's just not going to do what you expect him to do. So yeah, I like Johnny Wilson here. I think because of the way we've done it, I, I I wouldn't love it if Johnny Wilson was their only receiver pick because he there's a ton of variance with him. He could end up being an all pro. He could end up being out of the league in two years. It's he's going to come down to. Whatever team drafts him has to have a very specific plan for him. Like, you can't just be like, oh, well, we did this with this receiver, so we're just going to do the same development plan for Johnny Wilson. No, he's a unicorn. He's a one-on-one. But you have Marvin Harrison. We have Marvin Harrison, right? We're good there. Let's double down and get Johnny Wilson because if we hit on him, now we're really rolling. That's a really interesting receiving, Corey, especially if someone like Tyquan Thornton actually does emerge because then you've got another, like, true burner deep threat who can line up Or Jalen Rager. Or Jalen Rager. Yeah, I, I really like the diversity in that receiver. Yeah. Right. So Johnny. it's you're this is a little bit of mad scientist dipping into the lab, but whatever. Let's have some fun with it. All right. I'm gonna pitch a pick here. All right. I don't know how you're gonna feel about it. I talked about mean MFers that you know, quote Landon Roberts run through an MFers face. Ray Davis don't go down, man. Yeah, I had a feeling Ray Davis right. does not go down. Uh I, I he's so fun to watch. Definitely some shades of Kevin Harris, Damian Harris, that kind of just SEC, nasty, eat it up running back. This is maybe a little early for him, but we've had a great draft. Uh, I do also really like Marshawn Lloyd. I'm seeing he's there. I think he's a more well-rounded yeah. back. Um, there's a ton of fun players here. Dwayne Carter, I really like, if we want to go defense. Chris Abrams Drain, who they are. Uh, oh, I hang on. Yeah, I... I'm a sucker for people who don't know. And there's not as many guys in this draft like this. So I haven't talked about it as much, but last couple of years has been a bunch. Taylor, I am a sucker for corners who are converted receivers. Yep. I love that because the ball skills are impeccable. They're always elite athletes. It's just a matter of getting reps. That That's a huge part of the reason I was so high on uh, Tyreek Woolen that year mm. was because, mm. you know, converted receiver. And I had Abrams drain circled for the Patriots last year. He went back to school, which is kind of surprising. He was supposed to be a top 50 pick last year. Uh, had a bit of a down year this year, as Missouri did. But um, I, I I love his makeup. I freaking love his makeup. If he, I think he's going to be top 100 pick. So I guess this isn't that much of a stretch, 103. Mm-hmm. But yeah, if you can grab he Chris Abrams some here. He's, he's got that jack, like, uh, other than the off-field stuff. I, like, right. drew that comparison. People were like, but he's fine off-field. Like, yeah, okay, I clearly meant everything else. The wide receiver background. The way that you can tell guys are receivers when it's very easy for them to transition and start looking for the ball. Where, like, they know, okay, I'm in the hip or I'm in good position. They turn around. They find it easily. They don't lose track of their targets. I love that from him. He is, like, very slightly framed. Again, it's that Jack Jones thing where 
He's very competitive as a tackler. Like he's not going to shy away, but sometimes you'll see him just kind of throw a shoulder out there and it's, you get kind of worried. He can be handled a bit in run defense and like guys are going to be able to work through him, I think. But at the same time, he's got legit ball skills. I don't think he's as diverse in terms of uh, his coverage technique as Jack Jones, but like you said, that's why he's probably going to go to the fourth because there's a lot of tools there and he's already a pretty good player, but you're going to have to just continue to develop him. Maybe not use him in an every down roll, but if you're talking about like a miles Bryant replacement or just somebody else in that cornerback room, especially with ball skills where we know that creating turnovers was an issue for them. I, I like him here. I like him. here. So there, there's an old baseball scouting philosophy. That's, you know, the time to run a first, if it takes two guys four seconds, I forget what the actual time is, but if it takes two guys, four seconds to run to first base and one guy does it with perfect form. And the other guy does it with bad form. Which guy do you draft guy with bad form? Cause he's going to get right. Better. Because they both had the same time, but the guy with bad form has more room to improve. That's yeah. these player uh, uh, position converts is yeah. Chris Abrams drain has only been playing corner for two years and he's up here in draft projection and in production and ability with guys who have been playing that position, some of them, you know, 10, 15 years, their whole lives. So, and uh, Cade Stover's here too. He's another one. He's a converted defensive end. I said this about Keon White last year. I don't think you want to make a team of player conversions because there's there's inherently more risk with them. Their floor is much lower. But I do, the Patriots generally have one or two of these guys every year, either in the draft class or as UDFAs. And, and Chris Abrams train, again, is a guy that, he's only been playing corner. I think it's three years now. Mm -hmm. Look how much he's picked up. Look how good he's gotten in three years. What's he going to be if he continues on this path in another three years? So this is the early fourth round. Perfect time to kind of gamble on a guy like that. Yeah, I, I, I love that pick here. Let's do it. All right. One more pick. Maybe we get our running back. Uh, we already uh, got Isaac Arendo. I you know, but Vince Clinton this time? well, Braylon Allen's there. Braylon Allen, Wisconsin running him. backs. What? I don't know much about him. Fill me in. Uh, you ever seen a Wisconsin running back not named James, not named James White? Ah, uh, yes, Jonathan. Yeah. Taylor. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you ever seen Melvin Gordon? You ever seen Jonathan Taylor? You ever seen? Todd, no, Todd Gurley was Georgia. I'm missing one. Uh, I'm missing a big one. But uh, hang on, Wisconsin. I don't. I'm gonna feel bad. Jonathan, you ever seen? Uh, oh, Monty Ball is who I'm thinking of. You ever seen Monty Ball? Ron Dane back in the day. Uh, Braylon Allen. 6'1", 235, just mauler, great ball security, um, runs with great effort. He can block. He's not afraid of contact. Yeah, again, I just, I, I, I just, he, he's down here because Wisconsin tried throwing the ball this year, which is weird. Um, he's a really good running back. All right, so him over Ben Sinnott. We're going running back at the end twice in a row. Yeah, yeah. Again, these tight ends keep falling, and it, it they're they're good at, at tight end right now. Like you, you add this guy as the goal line option with Stevenson and um, uh, Antonio Gibson. Gibson, yeah. And you're you have a very complete. We, we talked about the complete wide receiver core, right? You now have the complete yeah. backfield. And also the Lobby train died down. Yeah, mostly just because of Antonio Gibson. They have yeah. very similar strengths. So yeah, I love Lauby, but it, it would feel like kind of a wasted pick if he was like even in the fifth round, considering you could plug holes elsewhere. Yeah. All right, Braylon Allen. Let's see what it looks like. It's gonna hate that pick because we took a running back, but yeah. oh, okay. it actually gonna be. It was only Chris Abrams Drain was the only one that just stupid. Beat. That's the that's the most like in terms of value. That's the best yeah. value pick. Well, Harrison at six, but yeah. That's why we do not try to appease the computer. We appease ourselves. No, I that's why I always block the PFF grades because you guys use them as the be all end all and you guys, the listeners, and like learn players yourselves. The whole point of this exercise. All right. Now we're going to go through one more permutation. This time, the goal is to trade back into the first round after we've already made our first round selection. This would be more if the Patriots decide they want to get a quarterback and then they ultimately say, you know, we want to get a tackle or a wide receiver who's available still in the first round. So let's do another mock here. Five rounds. All right, so who are we trading with? Um, I I I still like the Bucks for this. They okay. need more picks. They their their cap situation's a mess. I know we've right. talked about the Packers. The Packers have two seconds. There's very little incentive 
as much as we've joked about like, oh, you know, the Packers and Elliot Wolf making that trade, there's very little incentive for the Packers to make a trade like this. The Bucks need assets. They need affordable players, especially after giving Baker that contract. So I look at the Bucks. It, it, uh, hang on, I'll, I'll pull the order up. There's is this what we should do in the draft? Like we just reduce the speed and then pick, or should we do it before? Well, I mean, it depends what we want to. We're targeting a receiver, right? We could do that, well, but yeah, I look at the, I look at the Bucks. I look at. I mean, the Bills make sense, but they're not going to give the Patriots first round pick. Mm. Um, the Bucks. And the Ravens are the two teams I look at that make the most sense here. Although with the Ravens, you can do a slightly different trade. If we're going up this high, it's the it's the uh, Bucks. Where are the Ravens at? So the Ravens are lower. Can They're we get any 30. higher? You think? Um, I think you get any higher than this. You're talking about doing the Kyle Duggar trade, where it's a second and third instead of a second, fourth, and sixth. Okay. What would you feel more comfortable with? I think that I don't want to. They need to make three top 100 picks. Yeah. Okay. All right. So are we good with this? Offer trade? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Now let's start our All draft. Right. Get our quarterback. Jaden Daniels? Yes. Jaden Daniels. All right. We're back, baby. Who's on the board? Pirate Murphy. Man, I wish I didn't have so many holes. Oh, that's so annoying. All, All right. So who's there for receiver? Who's there for tackle? Yes. I feel like in all these Sims, the tackles go high. It's always 80 Mitchell, and you never get a guy like Latham falling, or you never get a guy like Amarius Mims falling. So this is the permutation we always have to do. I'd say take Mitchell. I think Mitchell is a clear class above everybody else who's on the board at this point. But man, I, 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 I like Amarius Mims, J.C. Latham, uh, fought now from Washington. Troy fought now. These yeah. guys could just as well. Fought. We talked about before how the run on. You know, it being such a deep receiver class could push receivers down the board. If that doesn't happen, Tyler Guyton's another. I think, didn't we just get Tyler Guyton? And like, oh no, we got him at 23. Yeah. Um, whether it's Tyler Guyton, whether it's fought now, whether it's it's Mims or Latham, like there's a chance one of these tackles falls to 23 too. But it seems like in PFF, it's it's just always A.D. Mitchell. He's always the odd man out here. Yeah. I, honestly, considering how much hype Xavier Leggett's getting, and the fact that I know Bills fans are really high on him, I just, I always try, I like in my head, I think his height is going to keep going up, especially because he's one of the few like outside guys with size and explosiveness. I feel like it's him and A.D. Mitchell are the only guys who are really in that like late first round, early second round tier, and then it kind of drops off. How do you feel about that? Not that we don't have to get Leggett in this one, but do you well, agree? Same. Because... Huh. I mean, if you're talking, you're talking about just X receivers, right? Yeah, like can okay. play. Then, Even if we see like can still be those guys with size. Well, I'm saying like like we're we're not including like Xavier Worthy as part of this conversation. We're, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um. You you know how I feel about Troy Franklin. Let somebody else figure out Tyquan Thornton. Uh, the Patriots don't need to do that again. Roman Wilson is maybe a fringe first round pick, but he's a smaller guy. Lad McConkey, smaller guy. Yeah. A after AD Mitchell here, uh, you know it, it drops off at the X a bit. Now that being said. Leggett okay. is sorry. Keon Coleman, I guess, is in that tier too. If he's your taste, yeah, I, 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 I don't think he's in the same tier as Mitchell. I think he's one tier down. Um, that's fair. Leggett is kind of the ultimate hip drop tackles illegal player. Yes, he is. Like he's yes, he he's in that he's in that tier. So, um, but yeah, I, I, you have to take eighty Mitchell here. You have to take eighty Mitchell. Fair enough. All right, locked in. And this is going to be the same mock draft. I've well, done we should have done a we should have done a longer one since we traded so many picks. I didn't even think of that. Well, no, because I think this kind of exemplifies the idea that this is what you give up when you trade down. That's true. All right, um, so we have this, our weapon. We have a quarterback who's available at tackle. This is the same draft I've done a million times. You take Patrick Paul here. Patrick Paul, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm doing this mock draft in my sleep. Quarterback yeah. at three. Trade up to 26, take A.D. Mitchell, draft Patrick Paul in the third. I uh, like half of what we text each other about is like this exact kind of situation. This is it. This is the draft. Um, so this is where I either hate, I don't hate doubling up. But so before we kind of had fun with this pick, took defense, took running backs, because we did, we had such a complete draft at the top of the board. Don't feel as much as strongly, not that it's not as strong. You got good players, but you need depth too. And this is where I want to get a player who can be more of an instant contributor or, you know, really hedge bet. So this is where I look at doubling up a tackle or 
going with a a corner who you think like can play immediately opposite Christian Gonzalez. So that's either Josh Newton or Javon Foster, pretty much our options. So I have no idea where Josh Newton is going to go. I he was a first round pick. He was a first round pick a year ago. He had a um, yeah. So nobody's mocking him. I tried this. Nobody's taking him in their mocks, which I think is part of the reason, which I think shows that nobody really knows where to put him. Josh Newton was a first round pick a year ago. He was a really, really good player. Pull up his NFL.com scouting report. There's something in there you'll see. I just did this with Brian. Um, was a really good player for TCU. Had a down year. Like he wasn't as good this year as he was last year, but he wasn't bad. He's also, he's a tweener. He's ah. a tweener man corner. Taylor, read that description and tell me what team likes this kind of corner. Mobile quarterback in this out versatility. Newton's 2022 tape was slightly better than 2023. He's capable in press and is made for old fashioned cover two looks where he can redirect the release and sink in his own coverage. We know one of the Patriots' bread and butter plays is their man that's or their Tampa two that's actually disguised as man coverage. So that's honestly so, that's they were getting tweener, scary. <laughs> tweener, Manch's own corner. I'll give you another, and maybe this changes post bill, but another try and true Patriots draft trend. The guys that have a really good season two years ago, yeah, I was that maybe that. aren't as good and fall down the board a little bit. They've taken a ton of those guys in the last five years. Josh Newton could not scream Patriots makeup more. Now the question is: so, so again, he's well, in one starts, of, four thousand plus career snaps. Is <laughs> that's right. forbidden? That's he's at one hundred three here. I don't yeah. totally think he was that bad this year to you know, qualify a fall out of the top 100, but most people seem to think so. I'll tell you, Josh Newton is the exact kind of guy the Patriots target in the draft. Whether that means they take him, whether it means he's there at 103, that's kind of what I struggle with. But going off the old draft trends, this dude is a, this is the Mike Cadlick Squidward meme, Patriot. This is their <laughs> guy. This is the guy they love to take. This is, you know, as Belichick bait as it gets. So also, the, he can get some revenge against A.D. Mitchell in practice because apparently yeah. he struggled against Texas. So hey, getting iron sharpens iron, baby. So All you're right. going to be able to – this is your new Miles Bryant, but he's a little bigger. So you're going to be able to play him on the boundary. You're going to be able to play him in the slot. He can probably play a little bit of safety if you let him work on that. Yeah, I think he's uh, I, I he, he's a total Patriot. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, like the lack of deep speed, you know, that's not the worst thing in the world. They can play around that, match him up, especially with this right. cornerback group. If they get somebody like him, I feel like they can play the matchup coverages they usually like. So, yeah. Newton over a running back or tight end, or yeah, I think you got to go more immediate than than project just based on the way the top of the draft went here. And Newton, I think, is a more immediate player. Locked in, see how we look. B minus, shut up. It, PFF hates Patrick Paul. Team. PFF hates Patrick Paul. I can't why? tell you why they hate him. I don't know. That is so bizarre to me. All right. And I think he, what did he have an, he had an informal meeting? Also, I think this is literally the mock draft I published on Monday. <laughs> but <laughs> no, I didn't take, who did I, 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 I took a different tackle. I think I took the kid from Yale. Um, but that's only because I already took Patrick Paul in a different mock draft. Yeah. So this what, what they would have just had uh, a seventh round pick, and that would have been it. Uh, they would have had ninety three, uh, one ninety three, the Mac Jones oh, pick, the two thirteen. Yeah. Damn. I so that's wish. where you, that's where you probably would have doubled up on tackle, taking a tight end, called it a day. I kind of want. I feel like these guys are going to be around. I kind of want to go one more time just to see what we would have gotten. Would you be down? We'll just speed run this. Uh yeah. But I, I would say also at that point you trade back probably from one ninety three and pick up some more picks. That's a good point. All right. All right. We'll do that real quick. We'll do a speed run. All right. Because I'm very curious. All right. So, da -da. Tampa. Tampa Bay, three. Oh, no. 34. Four. Yeah. Yeah. 26. I'm getting myself confused. 26. 26. Yeah. 180. Right. Let's take this off. Uh, I do it with 193. Just. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's still good enough. All right. That, that should still work. Yeah. I, we were doing 180 to mirror. A, a trade that was done by the um, Jacksonville Jaguars a couple years ago, but I, I mm -hmm. think 193 would work too. And there's a reason for, I'll explain the reason for that in a second. All right. All right so AD. Yeah. Do we want to make any oh, trades right Patrick now? Paul. 
No, yeah. so take Patrick Paul here. Well, you said you wanted to see who we could get after that. So yep. let's, not, let's not deviate. Yep. Now, the only question, if Josh Newton's not still here, I don't know, take like Cam Hart or somebody. But um, where do you go? Where do you go? Uh, you, oh, the Bills took him. Do you want to reset it? Uh, who's Wait, who was left the corner? Let's see. Is the BC kid there? I don't love it. BC. No. Yeah, no. See, this is where th there was a run on corners. It drops off hard at this point. After Josh Newton, Cam Hart, uh, the kid from BC, whose name is escaping me, like it drops off pretty pretty steeply after that. So, so you do here. Direction? What's up? Do we just want to go a different direction then? Well, do you want to reset it one more time and see if we can get back to where we were? All right, yeah. Why not? <laughs> we're already here. All right. No, nah, no. Nah. We're going to get good at this. It's going to be muscle memory. Yeah, no, that's exactly what happens. Da, 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 da. Yep. Da. Da. All right, boom, boom. That's going to do it. Boom. Didn't even have to look for him. <laughs> that's oh, how it goes. Where you at? Where you at? That's ridiculous. It's insane. <laughs> it's it's so under stupid. Michael Pratt. Are you kidding me? That's so that's so disrespectful. I don't even care about positional value. Uh, now nah, he went again. Are you kidding me? Okay, I think we maybe just got lucky with literally two picks. What do you say? Um, see, I wouldn't take it. So what I would do at this point, I wouldn't take any of these corners. Is I'd trade down from here. Okay. All right. We'll try that. Uh, who uh, do you want to trade with? Let me see here. And you're creating a massive, massive gap in the board, but this is the kind of the middle of this class isn't great. Let's see. So we're at 137. Um which was forfeited last year. Interesting. Um, so this should go for, so last year, the, uh, the bills traded 137 to Washington for 150 and 215. So, no, that's a little rich. You got to go a little further down the board. I think it's the 145. I, I would go, a, a who is anybody else calling on that thing? Uh, like where it says teams interested. Philly. That's about right. Yeah. Okay. Pull trigger. Well, I don't think you're gonna get 177, but um, you yeah. get You could, yeah. You, no, you you could probably get a little more than that, but if they're the only team calling, that's the deal. Yeah. Hang on. Really is, is there is there any other teams? It's just those two. Who has 150? Scroll down on the left there. Who has 150? Saints. Let's see. All right. Yeah. The Saints are always down to trade. No, it's yeah. perfect. Uh, no, so it 150, 199. We're gonna get the Brady pick. Ah, uh, that it? should work. That 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 should, yeah, that that would work in real life. Okay, yeah, we'll just do that for us. Thank you for your business. All right, where are we going here? Uh, uh all right, so we've taken Daniels, AD, Paul. Who's there for tackle? Tackle, we got. Javon Foster. Yep. 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 All right. So we got two tackles now. We're in good shape there. Who's there a tight end? AJ Barner. Sure. Oh, well, let's see who else. We get on the right there. We want to yeah. want to double dip. See if Tip's still there. I wouldn't double dip a tight end because you, okay. you, you so got to have roster it. spots. Now you're carrying four tight ends. I'll leave that up to you. Huh? I'll say Big Ten tight end. I'll let you. I'll let you go from there. I just think Barner's more well rounded. All right. Take Barner. Um, yeah, we lost tip. We got left. Hmm. This is where I need to watch more. Who's, ah, who's there a corner? Just... Who's there a corner? Is MJ Devonshire still there? No, AJ Woods. No. Um, yeah, see, I really don't love any of these corners. Who's there at safety? Safety. Trey Taylor, but we've already talked about that's a complicated situation. Tyler Owens, isn't he going to go way earlier than this? Yeah, that's that's a respecting the board thing. Who's there at running back? Josh Proctor, someone they had a visit with, or uh, I think met with the senior or something. Uh, running back, you said? Yeah. Isaiah Davis is one of their guys they've met with. Or yeah, I can see Isaiah team. Davis here. Isaiah Davis, sorry. Yeah. Yep. This is going to be tough. I'm not going to know a lot of these guys. <laughs> Um, this is again put Bub Means in the simulator. 
<laughs> Isn't and Andrew Rame the one that they talk to? Well, haven't they talked to Andrew Rame, the Patriots? Have they? I, I haven't seen that. Um, Let me see. I might be making that up. Uh, tracker. Going to my handy dandy roster tracker for draft prospects available on clns.com. All right, let's see. Rain. They did not. I made that up. That was in my head. Um, but they could use a center just in case. Is anybody else here really? Oh, I like the guy from Florida. If you want a center, I, I like the, the kid from Florida whose name was is escaping me. It's Kingsley something. Kingsley Egukon? Egukon? I won't say that long. All right, so Poultry? Yeah. All right. All right, so we didn't get Josh Noon, but honestly, respecting the board, if he is being mocked in the fourth, at least it feels like a little more fair, I guess. Right. James Daniels, AD, we got two good tackles. We got a good tight end, a running back who makes a lot of sense, big guy with experience, and we got a backup center. I like it. There you go. What do you think? Which of these uh, three yeah. would you prefer that we did? The one where they get the best quarterback. Chain Daniels. I, I mean, that's – Here's the thing. You can do some really fun, really complete drafts if you don't take a quarterback in the top 100. But then you don't get the top 100 quarterback. And really, it's you know <laughs> top of the board quarterback. So, and that, it, it, Taylor, I you've heard me say this a million times. All or not, you either take them first, you take them last. If, they're, if they don't love any of the quarterbacks at the top of the board or they feel they are not properly prepared to take a quarterback, load up the rest of the roster. I have no interest... We got – actually, no, we got Michael Penix at 34 in one of these, right? So that's my favorite because yeah. I think they got a top 10 caliber quarterback with the 34th overall pick. But if – I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think he's going to make it to 34. So if you don't get the quarterback at the top of the draft, load the rest of the thing up. Load the rest of the thing up, add a ton of talent, and you go back for the quarterback next year. Maybe you sign Dak Prescott or you trade for Trevor Lawrence. Um I, I have no interest in Bo Nix at 34. Everybody thinks they're so creative. Everybody's so creative. Taking <laughs> Bo Nix at the, Did you get that reference? That's like a deep ass. Oh, wait, reference. no, I don't. I oh, just like the tone. There's this woman who, uh, she's very funny. She, like, um, does whatever it's called, like, the threading of the video, or it's like her video on another video of these uh, people just making this god-awful food, just terrible recipes. She goes, everybody's so creative. And then it's just, like, disgusting. But um, everybody's so creative with Bo Nix at 34. And it's like, but are you taking Bo Nix at 34 because you think he's a good player worthy of the 34th overall pick? Are you taking mm -hmm. him at 34 because you wanted to draft Marvin Harrison or you wanted to draft Joe Alt or you wanted to trade down, but you don't want to do a mock without a quarterback because it feels wrong? Because those are two very different things. If you're taking Bo Nix just because, oh, I need a quarterback in here. That doesn't do anything. You're just giving up a chance to get an actual good player with a premium asset. So I, that's still where I am. I have no interest in Bo Nix at 34. I don't even have a ton, ton of interest in Spencer Rattler, you know, in the late, uh, late on day three, even though I've come around on Spencer Rattler, I've warmed up on Spencer Rattler. There are teams Spencer Rattler makes sense for. Patriots are not one of them. If you're not taking a quarterback third, don't even talk to me until 137. And then maybe it's only Joe Milton. And then don't talk to me again until we're outside of the top 200. And then you can take Jason Bean or Andrew Peasley all you want, but you don't have an answer at quarterback. That's still where I'm, that's still where I'm at. If you're not going to take the quarterback at three, we're on to 2025. We, we can start talking about Shadur Stand, Sanders. We can start talking about Quinn Ewers. We can start talking about Trevor Lawrence. We can start talking about Dak Prescott. Somebody needs to build a mock draft simulator that lets you do like two years worth of off season. So I think that's <laughs> really fun. I don't even think it's really a matter of whether they are ready to take on a quarterback. If you like the quarterback, take him. It doesn't like then build your roster around him. You have Jacoby Reset, Mayo, you know, whether or not he meant it already said that Jacoby can be a starter. He has been a starter in the league. So if you need him to just take a bunch of the hits and kind of work out the kinks in the offense early, you do that. But I agree. If they like one of these guys or both these guys, absolutely stay put. Um, Prescott, people, I just, I don't understand. I get because the Cowboys haven't had a lot of playoff success, but I think, pretending like Dak Prescott is one of the best quarterbacks in football. is just kind of deranged. And before we get off, the only question with Penix, the Patriots don't seem interested. 
I think that could potentially be a smoke screen. Because Tyler yeah. Hughes has worked with him for an entire season. He knows him personally. They worked really closely. Obviously, he was with the receivers, but um, or he was just an offensive assistant, right? Just an offensive assistant for a Washington. Yeah, general offensive assistant. Yep. Yeah. So I, I think that they are just saving their ammunition. It, top 30 business will tell us more than anything. But the fact they haven't met with him at the draft or anything, I don't think that's really a big deal. I, I think they can kind of wait on that. But uh, this is a lot of fun, buddy. Anything uh, you want oh, to yeah. plug before we get out of here? A uh, ton of content up on 985sportsup.com. Put up a mock draft on Monday. I have um, uh, positional previews are going through wide receivers for yesterday. Tight ends are tomorrow. And uh, keep an update on pro days and all that. Awesome. Thank you so much, buddy. And thank no you all for watching. As always, take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. 